Okay, it shows the proportion of the working age population in reliance on state-funded benefits. And you can see that the UK is very much at the lower end of the distribution. And one of the things I'm always tickled by this, in the sense, is that if we took out the fact that we have a maternity leave system in this country, we would have lower welfare reliance than the US. I also note in passing we have lower welfare reliance for disability benefits than the US. And yet at times we're argued that we should be focusing on the US model as a welfare reform, as perhaps that kind of get tough kind of message. Actually, we have no welfare reliance problem relative to other developed nations. We are one of the best performing, if you like, in that particular metric. Finally, uh, and this is the kind of picture of uh, the proportion of the population in the UK reliant on the big three welfare benefits over the last sort of 30 years or so, is that, and I think it's kind of well known, is that welfare reliance, people at the proportion of the population reliant on welfare, is in long-term decline in the UK. It's gone up in the recession. Okay, that's what recessions do. They push people out of work. And some of those people rely on welfare. But the long-term trend certainly relative to the mid-1990s, is for a steady decline in the proportion of the population reliant on welfare. Okay? That seems to be substantively driven by two processes. One is the improving financial rewards given to work under the previous government through tax credits, which profoundly changed the employment rate of lone parents. Yeah? And that the labour market was performing better in its in its sort of mix, if you like. It was less focused on certain sections of the population. It was broader in its regional re reach. It was broader in its educational reach. There was less concentration of worklessness on sections of society, which improved the welfare picture. Now, one of, you know, obviously in that picture, if you look at it, is the one group where welfare reliance was not declining ahead of the previous recession or the current recession. Depression might be the better word, actually. Was that for reliance on disability-related benefits. Okay? Uh, so, the focus on disability-related benefits by the last government was very much late in the day. Okay? It focused very much initially on uh, long-term unemployed, particularly youth unemployment. It pushed a lot next on lone parents and trying to move them into work. The disabled population was very much the last group which got any serious kind of attention in thinking about welfare reform. Uh, under the previous government. Okay? Um, but I just wanted to sort of talk a little bit about what the sort of dynamics were of uh, reliance. I'm going to stand up for this one. This is going to get a little bit hard, so I hope this is okay. okay. Is that the reliance on disability benefits is incredibly lagged from things that were happening in the past. Okay, so this is the picture of those people who've been reliant on benefits for more than two years, then five years, then ten years. This is because data's become available more recently, so we can't get the full historical picture. The point I want to make is, is that the overall picture of stability on disability benefits was masking the fact that at the shorter durations, and at each stage, if you like, as we go through it, that decline was going on, was that the benefit reliance on disability benefits was declining at all durations except the very, very, very long-term reliance. Okay, five, ten years plus. Okay, and if it's ten years plus, we're talking 15, 20 years worth, right? Now, this rise is a historical artefact of what was happening back in the 19, late 1980s and early 1990s. Okay, this is a historical, in a sense, uh, uh, echo from what was happening 20-odd years ago in the welfare system. Okay? And this is kind of why was that in the last recession, as in any recession back in the 1990s, reliance on welfare increases. It even increases amongst the disabled population with something of a lag. And it seems to me that it's fairly clear, certainly from the 80s experience, that what happens in a recession is firms disproportionately push out people who are marginal to their workforce, and that includes people who are sick and disabled. There is an exit push, if you like. The disabled people are increasingly managed out of the workforce in times of recession, when firms are under acute financial stress. That is, seems to be happening again. Less marked a little bit last time, but generally the employment picture is less marked than last time, the loss of jobs. But it seems to be happening again. You can see the kick up. Okay, so this kind of pushing out of people, uh, new claims rising as a result of the economic cycle, 
uh, is something which occurs. It seems to be a deliberate act of response to poor labour market conditions by firms. And that's one of the reasons why we got this long period of relatively high welfare reliance amongst uh, people with disability benefits. They've been pushed out, stayed out, no way back, that you get this steady build-up of people with long claims dating back as a historical artefact from a long time ago. Okay? To say that slightly differently was that if you looked at it in the sense of steady state of where it was going, we were in a situation where reliance on disability benefits was in sustained decline, that we would have moved from something like 2.7 million to somewhere about 2.2 million before this process of reform started and before the current recession. Right, now I view, and this is kind of my take on things, is that not only are we trying to move into a situation where we want people with disabilities and long-term health problems to be able to work and to be able to move back into work, I would just emphasize in, emphasize in passing that half of the battle is trying to stop people from leaving work in the first place, and that's really not received as much attention as it should do, if we're really trying to be serious about holding people in work with disability and lifetime uh, long-term illnesses, then we've got a major problem with the fact that people are able to be pushed out and managed out of disability workforce in a way that doesn't apply to some other groups. Putting that to one side, if we're trying to build a system which enables people to come back into the world of work, we're in a situation which is very radically different from JSA for the regular unemployed. We need a system where a coalition is built of support and engagement around the individual, and that refers to their personal care and support. It refers to an intermediary actoring to, in a sense, negotiate that, that process of returning to work. That's currently occupied by the space of work program providers. Maybe that's going to work, maybe it isn't, we don't know yet. And it needs, and crucially it needs, the employers to be part of that kind of process. That employer relationship in this kind of process, in my view, needs to be negotiated by the intermediaries. That intermediaries need to be working alongside people with disability and health problems, negotiating relationships with employers to bring the kind of the match, if you like, together, because it's not going to happen organically, for obvious reasons. Secondly, the match, in a sense, needs uh, uh, to be a willing match. We can't have a situation where people are forced into jobs which are potentially damaging for their health, forced into situations where the job isn't flexible enough for them as an individual, even if it's flexible enough for the employer. It's got to be built around the individual, and the best person who understands that is, surprise, surprise, the individual. That means we can't have compulsion to take jobs. We can't have compulsion, even in my view, to look for jobs. This is an engagement process where people need to be supported, brought along, agreeing to where they want to go, stating where they want to go, sorry, I should say. They need to lay out a vision of what they want to happen and that the process of the support services, including intermediaries and employers, is to try and make that vision a reality. That's kind of what I was trying to articulate when I wrote about this, is that this is a very different model from that used for regular unemployed people in several dimensions. The first dimension, in a sense, is that the support and engagement needs to start straight away, whereas with regular unemployed people it starts after a period of time. And secondly, it's got to be an entirely voluntary process where a relationship is established with intermediary to discuss, inform, and set about the process of trying to move, them for, move people forward and take them into the labour market. That, as I said, involves involving uh, uh, employers. Now, the problem here at the moment, as I see it, is that we are in serious danger of undermining the potential positives of that process, which was a point Carlia made, is that what's going on at the moment in terms of what I'll call the welfare reform process is making it, in my view, substantively harder to build that positive agenda of trying to help people move back to work. Okay, and there's two major reasons for that. I think I may have jumped ahead of myself. Okay. Uh, I just want, actually, I was going to say one more thing. I'll come, I'll come back, sorry. Um, is that the use of statistics at the moment is really pissing me off, right? Um, 
is that we're getting this kind of statistic that seven, only 7% 7 of people being tested by the WCA are being found incapable of work. Yeah. Well, the true figure is about 30% of people who are being tested by the WCA test are being found eligible for ESA after appeals. It's about 25% before appeals. This is of new claims, not the people being, re being retested now. But something like 40% are never tested at all. They leave the benefit before the testing process starts, and that's a natural process of people on some disability benefits having short-term conditions, and they return to the labor market. Okay? So something like 60% of the population being tested are being found eligible for benefits, not 7% being found incapable for work. These are profoundly different statements. Secondly, and this is kind of a paradox I find quite interesting, is that despite all the language that all of these people are somehow being caught out by the new kind of test, is the number of claims for people on ESA has barely fallen one iota. Right? And the reason is, the new test is different from the old one. It's pushing about 10% of people over the line that is making them ineligible for ESA relative to incapacity benefits. But, as I showed before, the number of claims is rising because of the recession. And this means that at the moment we're in a kind of stasis. That the, the recession, which I think is deliberate managing sick and disabled people out of the workforce by employers, is offsetting the counterforce of the WCA test in terms of making people and pushing them over the line to make them ineligible for ESA. Okay? Finally, then, just talking about that in a little more detail, so that's kind of what I think is happening in terms of the WCA test, but there's two things which I think are deeply regrettable in this process. The first is, of those people who are being pushed across the line, we know absolutely nothing about what's happening to them. At no stage in the process, and this is the previous government's the, the fault, at fault here, have we set up the kind of tracking mechanism to say what's happening. Is it the case that people's conditions are deteriorating because of the stress associated from not being able to get access to welfare systems that are suitable for them? Are they moving into work? We simply don't know. We simply also don't know whether it's different across different kinds of conditions. And one of the things that we could easily be doing at this stage is trying to work out which, system, which part of the conditions people are presenting with the, the system is failing. And yet none of this information is being gathered, used, analysed, and I, can't, I think it's just completely unacceptable that you're taking a group who are very vulnerable, you're introducing a new system, you don't properly test what is happening to people as they go through the system, you aren't following people, and we have a sense policy making by an iterative process of reform and screen. They introduce a reform, everybody screams, they change something, everybody screams, they change something again. And each time they say, we've changed it, it's fine now. But at no stage is it actually tested to prove that it's not fine. I think this is entirely the wrong group to be trying to make policy making on the hoof. <coughs> this is something you've got to work through. You've got to prove the concept's working. You've got to materially follow, if you like, people, what's happening to them as they go through the kind of process. And then, and only then, do you start trying to deliver that to a population who have been reliant on welfare, sickness and disability benefits for a long period of time. I think it's extremely also strange that you're taking a group potentially on welfare for two years plus, three years plus, typically a lot longer, taking them out of uh, incapacity benefit, not putting them in ESA, and really not offering them any kind of additional support or recognition within the welfare system to try and help them move them into work. Anybody who's been out of work for that long time will struggle to find work. People with health problems are only going to struggle more. Finally, in a sense, uh, on this... I feel that there are two deep contradictions here in this kind of process which are undermining where we, where we should like to try and go. We want a process which is engaging people. We want a process that's supporting people and carrying them through to try and facilitate and make work a viable possibility for them. That requires a relationship between intermediaries and the individual. It requires a positive relationship between intermediaries and individuals. And the process of, if you like, the hostility of the reform process that's going on and how it's treating people is only going to make people who get onto ESA to entrench. I'm not going to risk anything by trying to make 
positive engagements on the road back to work. It only puts my current, what I've achieved, at risk. It brings the shutters down. It makes the whole positive engagement process almost impossible. The scream, if you like, of people as they're facing and going through this process is only going to make the realisation of a positive agenda of moving people into work the harder. And echoing that point in a slightly different way, in my view, the process of moving people as an engagement process back to work under the work-related activity group is going to take two to five years. The conditionality, sorry, the contributory uh, disability benefits contribute, she is being capped at one year. 